When Dave Eggers was 21 years old, both of his parents died of cancer within five weeks of each other. He was left alone to take care of his eight-year-old brother while trying to build his own career as a writer. He founded Might, a short-lived but well-remembered satirical magazine in 1994. Today, at 29, he has written his memoir, and here is the title, A Heartbreaking Work of Staggering Genius. Chico Kakutani of the New York Times called it a virtuosic piece of writing, a big, daring, manic-depressive stew of a book that mostly announces the debut of a staggering, talented new writer. He is currently editor of McSweeney's, a literary journal and website. I am pleased to have him on this program. First of all, the title. Mm. Would you say to in your table of content, in your preface, what? Um, I, I, I say that... Uh... Dave, you wrote the book. Yeah, no, I can't remember. I haven't read <laughs> the book for a long time. To, look, if you're sort of put off by the title, I understand. Yeah, no, it, it was a, it was a, it made me laugh, and uh, and then it just sort of uh, stuck. It, <laughs> it kept on making me laugh, so we left it. And I thought it would it would uh, uh, anger the right sort of people that I wanted to anger. So uh, we left it just to see what would happen. But you also have some guides for reading the book, too, which is we ought to get it to right before we get too far in here. Oh, yeah. The, um, first of all, I am tired, I am true of heart, and also, I assume this is what? And also, you are tired, <laughs> you are true of heart. Where does that come from? I have no idea. <laughs> You're asking the wrong guy. <laughs> no, I just, you only uh, wrote the book. Yeah, no, I, yeah, <laughs> I wrote it. And I Rules and suggestions for enjoyment of this book. There is no overwhelming need to read the preface, really. <laughs> it exists mostly for the author and those who, after finishing the rest of the book, have for some reason found themselves stuck with nothing else to read. If you've already read the preface, and I wish you had not, we apologize. We should have told you sooner. <laughs> this is the very first paragraph. Yeah. Uh, congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Let's sort of see how you got here. Um, when did you want to be a writer? When did you know that was what... Um, Basically, almost never. I grew up um, studying art. I was trained sort of to paint since I was maybe seven, sent to art schools and tutored and studied painting throughout high school and college. And um, it wasn't until maybe you know late in college that I started studying journalism and then thought maybe I would go into that. But I still sort of figured that was kind of a, uh, just a backup kind of thing and that I would be a painter but somewhere along the lines I I, uh, I got hooked on the whole newspaper thing in college and uh, and producing magazines and and uh, and just sort of the reach that we had in doing that and sort of the impact so still paint yeah um, I'm painting right now I'm painting a lot of pictures of birds with wooden planks for our feet we'll That's get to I'm this <laughs> in a moment but this is pretty neat uh, this is McSweeney's which is uh, what you now edit. Yeah. Issue number four, late winter, 2000. This is a kind of a, kind of what the New York might have been at one point, some have said, but it's a literary magazine. Yeah. Serious writer, many of them, some we know, like David Foster Wallace, mm -hmm. yeah. others we don't know, have an opportunity to write about, at length, yeah. about subjects of their choice. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's um, sort of a home for misfit uh, pieces that could never fit in anywhere else or the authors would never be able to sell anywhere. We'll take anything. The, we'll, the weirder the better. The stranger the longer. It doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Your parents died what, within five months of each other. Uh, about five, five weeks. Five weeks, yeah. I'm sorry. Five weeks. Um, so you're there. You're the oldest. You have an eight-year-old. Well, I had two older siblings, actually. But I was closest uh, in age to, to age. my little brother. And the one at home and the others had responsibilities. Yeah, yeah. They had already started their lives. <clears throat> so what happens? Well, it was, um, we had, luckily, um, we had a lot of time to think everything through while my parents were sick. And um, so we coordinated everything beforehand, what would happen, where, where we would go. And um, my sister was enrolled in law school. It was about to begin. And so that's why me and my brother moved to Berkeley to be near her. So we lived down the street from each other and then just sort of uh, shared responsibility uh, for Toph, my brother. And, um, Which is short for Christopher. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it worked out, it worked out beautifully. You know, we, we, uh, we were sort of tag teaming and um, I don't know, we had, we had a great time in Berkeley. It was just sort of 
started over and, and trying to and made it up as we went along. So. Mm. <laughs> well, tell me that. Uh, um, you, I mean, you two obviously got along. It was fun. Well, uh, you also felt the brunt of the responsibility of parenting. Yeah. I and mean, you hear other parents saying, well, yeah, I let my kids smoke, and you'd get, you know, you'd want to take over parental guidance of that child uh, yeah. because you thought that was outrageous. You know, yeah. You, yeah, we, we, our, our family was, uh, we were pretty, they were pretty strict, my parents, about a lot of things, and I, and I took on a lot of that, well, and you, and you, 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 uh, you take on the good and you reject the others and you try to improve upon the things that you feel like could have been improved upon, uh, just like any parent, I think, would do, um, and you learn, and you learn from the lessons of your own parents, and, 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 uh, they, they did all the, all the real work, you know, the, uh, from when my brother was, in, until he was eight, you know, I think that's the real, that's the hardest part, to guide it's somebody. To go birth to eight. Yeah, and, and by the time Toph and I ended up together, he was pretty well formed and we were, we had been, you know, best friends since he was a baby. He, I used to be, uh, run a summer camp and he went to that, and so we spent all, every waking hour together over the summers and stuff, and I was home a lot, so it was just sort of natural that he would live with me, and... It just turn, sort of turned into a kind of a roommate, partnership, brother, parent thing, depending on the situation and the day and the, whatever came up. But it, you also had responsibilities. I mean, you were charged with it. You'd given yourself and your parents. You, you all knew that this was going to be your responsibility. Yeah. Because everybody else was either dead or else they were off on their own thing. So you were there at home with the responsibility of making sure that everything turned out okay. Yeah. Yeah, but you know what are you gonna do? <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I mean, you, it was, you didn't I, have a lot of choice. Did I you? jumped at it. You know, I wouldn't have had it. It wasn't even a vague consideration that that there any, were no anything. Alternatives. Well, you know, I, I guess in some situations you might ship a boy off to a uh, school a labor camp somewhere no. or something. <laughs> they, I don't know. Maybe military school. Yeah, was right. It? Um, <laughs> which but, may know, be better or worse we, yeah, depending on which one you're exactly. talking about. Exactly. Depending on yeah. Um, but we just had so much fun together, so it was just, uh, we just goof around, and uh, so I looked forward to it um, from the very beginning, and it was, it was a blast. Now he's now, what, 16 about now? Yeah, he'll be 17 in about a week. Yeah, he doesn't do interviews. No, <laughs> no, he's busy with school. He doesn't really pay attention to it. you don't stuff. want him to do interviews, or he doesn't want to do interviews, or it's, up it's to your him. book? It's up oh, to so him. Oh, so, I see. If he, if he wanted to, he, he, you know, he, a few times people have asked, and he was like, eh. No, yeah, thanks. I don't think so. It's got other stuff going on. Well, you're not exactly thrilled about it. You used to lampoon interviews and oh, yeah. interviewers. And sure, and I, and I, I still do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the that way that some Mike. of these interviews have turned out in print, it's very lampoon. I saw one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was. And it's weird how you say one thing and it comes out some other way. Uh, but it's interesting to see it from this perspective. Yeah. You must be overwhelmed by the critical response. Um, well, I, yeah, I try not to, uh, I try, I, my friends uh, try not to tell me about anything because it's hard to sort of... You're saying that you didn't read the uh, Chico and the... I, oh, sure, I read it, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't read the negative ones. <laughs> if I hear about one, and I, and I beg everybody not to tell me about it because I just don't want it in, in my head. But, um, yeah. yeah, the good ones, um, <clears throat> I guess I'll, I'll look at this at, at some point. Yeah. I, I've heard, no, I've heard, heard it was good. pretty good. So, yeah, okay. um, but... Um, yeah, it's it's fun. It's nice when people say nice things. I guess. So after doing might, yeah, uh, it sort of folds. It goes nowhere. Yeah, died a slow died. lingering death. Slow yeah. lingering death. Uh, then you come to New York for Esquire. Yeah, Brooklyn. We we lived in the Upper West Side actually. Yeah. Toph and I did. Live in Brooklyn now. Yeah, we're in Brooklyn now. Yeah. We like it a lot better. A lot more space. Yeah. No space to run around in the Upper West Side. I mean, the apartment was about as big as this table. It was really, it was too, it was too small for <coughs> him, especially. He was growing like seven inches a year, so it's, uh, it was too big for two of us. From might to Esquire, it's quite a leap. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't at the time realize how, how big a leap it would be. Um, it was a very different atmosphere. The, most of the magazine world in New York is a little different than what we were used to. You know, we were, we were sleeping at the office under our desks, you know, working 18 hours a day and just sort of, uh, it was mostly friends of mine from high school. And it was, it was different being in like an actual, more sober work environment. And, um, 
it didn't uh, it, we didn't it didn't necessarily take was <laughs> <I mean, laughs> a perfect uh, match no 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 but you know uh, nice people and it uh, just wasn't yeah. quite right and, and how did McSweeney come about um, well luckily uh, my time at Esquire there was um, I had I was left with some free time <laughs> and so while I was trying to work on this book and uh, at, at Esquire I had some I had a lot of free time and so I started putting together McSweeney's as just something that I knew would, would uh, I could see it's all the way to print. And at Esquire, there's a lot of editors. You don't necessarily get to uh, assign or edit or, or publish all the things that you want to do. And I had a lot of friends that had some great ideas, but they couldn't fit them into any commercial vehicle. And the periodicals weren't taking them. And so we put, we sort of put, the first issue of McSweeney was almost all pieces that had been killed or, uh, you know, couldn't find their way into uh, into regular magazines. Uh, yeah. It opens at the bottom. Oh, I see. Uh, just this. Oh, uh, I see. Like this? Nope. Like oh. um, like a car hood. You're opening. Fire. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Oh, oh, I see. Like that. And so I mean, yeah. this is rather. What this is printed in Iceland. Yes. So we have to sort of go up to Iceland to get yeah. it, don't we? <laughs> no, they're on their way. Um, most of we have some copies of this issue in the country this right now. Yeah. The rest of them are on a boat right now, on the, making their oh. way back to from Reykjavik. I want to get to some of the sadder things as, as well, but but tell me what was great about this. I mean, what was it that that you found amusing about this experience of, of living with your younger brother and being both parent and friend and brother and everything? Well, I think um, our interests have always been pretty similar because we we spent a lot of time growing up together, and um, so his sense of humor was very similar to mine. <laughs> Uh, he uh, he was the victim of my influence since he was uh, very young, and so he was always able to make me laugh and vice versa. And we had the same interests in sports and ping pong and throwing food at each other. And uh, uh, we were both slobs, and so it it was very very. Uh, I don't know. We became sort of inseparable for many many years, and because. Uh, well, I don't know, there wasn't anything that I couldn't do with him or I didn't want him there. And he sort of, uh, he felt the same way. So it, it um, you know, I don't know, if given the chance to live and hang out with your best friend at all times is a pretty good deal, you know. Marriage and, should be so good. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, the advantage of him being young and technically under my uh, parentage, if that's mm -hmm. a word, uh, I can make him do stuff that I didn't want to do. Yeah, yeah, local right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could if I if there was an errand I didn't want to run or whatever, I could always pull that on him and make him do it. So it worked both ways. What is really riveting about this is this sort of the insight and the hilarity of you. You're it's almost like you're going through life and you're observing yourself going through life. Yeah. Yeah, it's. I mean, the, most, uh, the vast majority of it's supposed to be self-parodying. Yes, it yeah. is. I mean, yeah, I, uh, I just found a lot of our opinions and our hopes and and the way we went about things was pretty um, funny in retrospect. What we were thinking about the world and our possibility and the possibility of our immediately changing the face of it, you know, uh, with might or with whatever endeavor we uh, took on and. Um, so I try to make light of that and how, you know, we would see an appearance on the real world as an opportunity to uh, save 40 million people from, you know, <laughs> lives of uh, boredom or tedium, you know? Tell me about finding the ashes of your mother. Oh, that's a surprise. That, you're blowing the... Uh, it was, that, that was actually supposed to be... Um, but you know, uh, we can't was, talk about the book. No, or? it's been written about a bunch of times. It was supposed to be the big surprise. Um, I, I ended up um, going to Chicago at one point. Lake Forest, where you grew up. Yeah, 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 and the whole Chicago area, and just sort of looking for things, retracing, because I we had left in a blur, and it was just um, we left all kinds of um, things undone, and uh, had never done a proper funeral or burial or anything like that. It was our parents' wishes, but um, so I went back to sort of retrace things and find things and maybe look, I don't know, it was kind of, it was self-punishing and kind of silly, but um, I was at the funeral home um, 
just their picking up papers, you know, any papers, copies of any papers that they might have. Uh, we had long years before given up any hope of finding the ashes. Um, and the guy went downstairs to Xerox the papers and came back with a box and, uh, uh, you know, with, with my mother's name on the label. And, um, so, uh, you, yeah, you can imagine. It was a shock. I, I don't know what else to say in there. It was, it was pretty, uh, yeah, it was pretty weird. Weird is what you would say. I don't know how else to, I don't know how yeah. to describe it. Well, but you it. Just it was... decided then. I mean, I, it, I... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, this is easier than the ending. Yeah. Uh, I would, you decide to spread the ashes, Lake Michigan? Well, it was either that or take it back on a plane, you know? Mm -hmm. And you start deciding these terrible things like, can you actually take it on a plane? Are they going to check it, you know, through the baggage? <laughs> or is it somehow sacrilegious to run it through the, the radar, the, the conveyor, the, uh, mm -hmm. the metal detector? And where, and you start having to make these uh, hair-splitting decisions of what is less sacrilegious or what is more respectful to this box and what, the, what, the, what does this box and its contents actually mean? And uh, does it mean anything? Does this any representative at all of this person you knew? And um, so I ended, up, I ended up deciding to, uh, to um, spread them in Lake Michigan, where you know, we had obviously spent lots of time. Bows and yeah, and then you're, you know, and then they're on your hand and they're falling you down your leg. Describe how light they feel. Well, it was, um, it's not, it's actually heavier than, than uh, I guess, uh, sometimes, in this case, heavier than you uh, uh, expect. It's not ash. It's uh, grainy and it's like sand itself, you know, or heavy, coarse sand. And, um, oh, I don't know, it just gets more and more brutal as you go along and you feel more silly. What and am I, I doing? And yeah, right and you're spilling it and it's on your shoe and, um, you know, and do you, can you... How do you, what motions are more dignified? And, and it's, a, it's a strange, absurd sort of situation to be in. And, and I think any time when you start really digging into that stuff, it's, uh, you start thinking that all of it is just better left undone, unsaid. Um, Why did and, you write about it? Uh, because it, uh, it was hard. Because it happened to you is the answer. Yeah. Yeah, I reached a point where I, I just, uh, it was, you know, the whole... That Catholic need for self punishment, I guess. The whole there thing. is an element of that here, isn't it? Oh, sure. We were brought up You're very brutal. much that way. <laughs> yeah. We, um, my mom was the biggest uh, martyr in the world. <laughs> and and uh, that's a part of it. She pronounced the word mata. Mata. You know, Don't be such a mata. <laughs> we didn't know what the word meant until we were like teenagers. We didn't know what the hell she was saying. <laughs> but uh, so this is the same thing. I don't know why. We all have this martyrdom. And, um, so it's, it's an act, and in a way, writing something like this is, is an invitation for uh, sort of a lacerating kind of criticism that I'm sure I've gotten here and there, and it's more of it's coming, you know? Um, right now, there's stories in the works, you know? Yeah, I, I, and, I read uh, one or two of them about. Yeah, and um, I, I knew a year ago exactly what would happen, which newspapers would say what, and it's just falling in line, and just like, just like I thought, and... Um, but uh, that's the way I saw it happening. And it was sort of like, well, it's a feeling of that you deserve it, you know, for even bringing it up in the first place. <laughs> but to see it all happen exactly the way that I thought it would happen is kind of strange. Although I didn't think that m as many people would like the book. Um, I certainly didn't think it was going to sell. But um, people, average people are, are enjoying it, which is kind of a shock to me. David Remnick, friend of this program, said... Eggers is an original new voice, the real thing. When you read his extraordinary memoir, you don't laugh, then cry, then laugh again. You somehow experience these emotions all at once and powerfully. David Sedaris said, the force and energy of this book could power a train. Then David Foster Wallace, true to form, has a much larger... <laughs> it takes yeah. him a while to say yeah. what he wants to say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, we were, you know, I just felt like we would run... We could have cut down that quote, obviously, but I just felt like uh, <clears throat> he, uh, I, the, the effort there was to sort of, he gave away parts of the plot, too. I thought that would be something 
that would be fun to do, to give away the plot in the back of the book <laughs> through a blurb. I don't know. We thought that would be interesting. You mean what happens at the back of the book? Is there anything you would read to me here that's your favorite passage in this book? Um, no, I, you know, I, I, not at all. <laughs> I hate to say that. I have no favorites. I'm not even I, sh I sure did. I remember what's in the oh, book. Oh, that's the truth. I, that um, is the truth, isn't it? I did my first three readings ever last week in San yeah. Francisco, and uh, I'd never read aloud before in my life, and uh, certainly not this book. I haven't read since I finished it, and and so I would just leave it up to the audience to pick a page number and I would read from it. Well, you got to skip over a lot of F-words here, too. Yeah, no, that would get really difficult. I was in Palo Alto, and I have some of my dad's families down there, and I was reading a passage that somebody in the audience had, had picked out randomly, yeah. and there were so many swear words that I had to stop. I was so embarrassed. I didn't know. Uh, I had to apologize profusely. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, that's the thing. A lot of it's pretty raw, and a lot of it I wrote, and uh, parts of it I didn't go back to. And I, didn't, I mean, like that very well, last... You're a literary fellow. What do you think it is that grabs all these people, David and the rest of them? Um, Truth? I really, maybe Insight? that's it. I think there's a rawness, maybe, that people sometimes appreciate. Um, but I, I have to be honest, I didn't know... I thought it was a 50-50 chance that the book would be torn to shreds when I finished it. It's hard to know. I had never written anything over maybe 12,000 words. And this is like, what, I, you know, 150,000 or something. And so at that point, you have no idea what you have in your hand, on your hands when you're done, if it's just a big, sprawling mess or if it makes some sort of sense. And, um, and, then, and then all of a sudden the deadline's there and you have to give it to the publisher and they're binding it. And I struggled every day. I couldn't believe that it was out of my hands, that it was gone, and I was making changes. You know, we, we published like five different galleys as I went along. So I'd, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and realize I had just the passage that would solve all the problems, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and then it just got worse and worse, and I have all these changes that I want to make for the paperback, you know? And um, it's hard to let that go, but I, at a certain point, you just have no idea what you've done, because I, I haven't read it through maybe ever. I don't even know if I've read it all the way through. So you're not sure what's in here. Yeah, no, I really don't. It's too, it's too weird to You almost it. stopped several times. Not quite. Never? Um, no, I was sort of um, determined... Uh, to go the wild. I to tend go to the finish distance. things once there's a deadline and once I owe people money and that kind of thing. <laughs> I had already cashed the checks. <laughs> I spent all the money on McSweeney, so I felt like I had to give him something. <laughs> but then, you know... Once it was done, yeah, there were a lot of days when I would call and leave messages at four in the morning saying, we should, this is a bad idea, let's pull it, this is really bad. I'm going to be embarrassed and I don't yeah, do this. Oh, I'll never be able to, to uh, you know, I'm going to oh exile God. myself. We're going to go to Iceland. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll live in Reykjavik. Franz Joseph or something, I was going to go further, you know. But uh, and then, you know, and then it's too late. People just kept on, and they, uh, they got used to me, uh, my late night phone calls and stuff. But... Uh, and then, it's, then suddenly it's out and people have already read it. It's very strange. This is what Jim Lewis says. <laughs> now, or Lawrence Wexler, truly splendid. The key word in the title, of course, is staggering, and not just because of the subliminal pun of Eggers. Rather, Eggers is some kind of staggering genius, the way Pavarotti is a singing one. And Kierkegaard got in this deep, <laughs> this endlessly, self ironizingly loopily, down-spiraling deep. He had to rely on God to save him, but Eggers somehow manages to save himself. All his endlessly knowing, self-undercutting, somehow ming managing to cut clean through to something more bottomlessly profound. A simple wonder, a knowing wonder to be sure, but no less abiding a wonder for all that. Man, I, I don't I'm think you can improve on that. He got the yeah, point, didn't well, he? And he got Pavarotti in there, which I was <laughs> really hoping that somebody would make that connection. I don't know. Yeah, no, Wesler, obviously, he could, he's, he's the greatest. He's been, he's been an incredible supporter. I would supporter. hope you'd say that now. Yeah. Otherwise, you are an ingrate yeah, of the ultimate dimension. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, he's been, but uh, uh, Lawrence Wesler has been a great uh, champion of the magazine and has helped us a lot and um, has brought a lot of writers into it. Uh, to us. Maybe these people are just saying these things because they want to appear in McSweeney's. Maybe yeah, that's maybe. what it's about. That could be They it. don't really like the book. They're just it. doing this it because they be want to curry favor with you. Yeah.
I think uh, it's quite possible. We'll find that out. <laughs> we'll leave so it let's to the, don't get too yeah. cocky here yeah. with all this. Yeah, let's leave it to the Observer. They'll, they'll, they'll take that all The time. New York Observer will take care of that, yeah. Yeah. won't they? <laughs> yeah. In the next couple of weeks, it'll all, it'll all become It'll clear. all even out. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Pleasure. Dave Eggers, a heartbreaking work of staggering genius. Uh, an extraordinary amount of uh, positive comment and review for this book. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.